Thus far, we've talked about polar coordinates and how they can help represent complex numbers to make multiplication and division of complex numbers easier. Now we're going to take a look at going to the next step, which is how we can do exponents with complex numbers. How do we calculate exponents? on complex numbers. And in, as you might imagine, in rectangular form, this can become quite a tedious process, especially if the exponent is a larger exponent. But in polar form, we can do a nice little trick with the exponents. First, let's consider, we'll let z be our complex number. It's equal to r times cosine theta plus i sine theta. Well, that means if I square both sides, z squared is equal to r squared times cosine theta plus i sine theta squared which then would be equal to r squared times cosine squared plus 2i cosine theta sine theta. Actually, I'm going to rewrite that as i times 2 sine theta cosine theta, because that should look familiar to us, minus sine squared theta. And it has to be negative because of the fact that we have an i squared, which makes your negative 1. So when I put this together then, what we end up with is a cosine squared minus sine squared. Cosine squared minus sine squared you should recognize as the cosine of 2 theta. Plus, we've got an i, and then we've got a 2 sine cosine. You should recognize that as the sine of 2 theta, which means when we squared our z, we ended up with r squared times the cosine of 2 theta plus i sine of theta. And if we continue this, similarly, z cubed is going to be equal to r cubed times the cosine of 3 theta plus i sine of 3 theta. z to the fourth is going to be r to the fourth times the cosine of 4 theta plus i sine of 4 theta. And you start to see the pattern developing, which is going to lead us to what is called de Moivier's theorem, which basically says if z is a complex number written in polar form, z to the n is equal to the radius to the n times the cosine of n theta plus i times the sine of n theta. For example, actually, let's highlight. That's our big theorem of the day. So for example, if I've got the complex number 2 root 3 minus 2i, and I want to take that to the third power. Algebraically, that would be quite tedious to do here in rectangular form. So let's convert that to a polar form complex number. r squared, we know then, is the x component, 2 root 3 squared, plus the y component, negative 2 squared. So r squared is equal to 4 times 3 plus 4. 
r squared is 16, so the radius is going to be 4. Cosine of theta is equal to the x component, 2 root 3, divided by the radius of 4. So the cosine of theta is root 3 over 2 when we reduce. The sine of theta is equal to the y component, negative 2 over the radius of 4. So the sine of theta is equal to negative 1 half when we reduce. And so we've got uh, x coordinate of root 3 over 2 positive, a y component of negative 1 half. I know that angle is 11 pi over 6. Putting that all together, then, we end up with our complex number with a radius of 4 times the cosine of 11 pi over 6 plus i sine of 11 pi over 6. And what we're doing, though, is we're taking it all to the third power. Using de Moivier's theorem, then, we can do that really quickly by just taking 4 to the third power times the cosine of 3 times 11 pi over 6 plus i sine of 3 times 11 pi over 6. Raising the radius to our exponent and multiplying each of the angles by the exponent. When we do, 3 over 6 is going to reduce to 2. And 4 cubed is 64. So we have 64 cosine of 11 pi over 6. I'm sorry, 11 pi over 2 plus i sine of 11 pi over 2 which technically we can reduce a little bit more because 11 pi over 2, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's the same as the angle 3 pi over 2. So let's simplify that one step further and say that gives us 64 times the cosine of 3 pi over 2 plus i sine of 3 pi over 2. If I wanted to know what that was in rectangular form, we could just simplify this resulting expression. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we've got 64 for our radius. Cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. That's the x-coordinate, because we're at 0 comma negative 1 plus i times the sine of 3 pi over 2, which is negative 1. And that just gives us negative 64i is what our example is raised to the third power. Let's see if I can get that all on one screen here. There we go. Now, the opposite of taking an exponent would be taking a root. And that's the last thing I want to look at here with these problems, is how do we take roots? I want to recall that when we have something like z to the sixth equals 1, a common mistake I see is people take the sixth root of both sides and say z equals 1. Sometimes they get z equals plus or minus 1 because they remember that an even exponent has that plus or minus on the square roots. But there's actually six solutions to this equation. If we were to subtract 1 from both sides, we have a difference of squares that could be factored as z cubed minus 1 times z cubed plus 1. And then the first factor is a difference of cubes, and the second factor is a sum of cubes. The difference of cubes factors to z minus 1 times z squared plus z plus 1. The sum of cubes factors to z plus 1 times z squared minus z plus 1 equals 0. And by setting each of these factors equal to 0, we end up with z equals 1. Uh, we'll take the other easy one, negative 1. 
And then the last two factors, the trinomials, we would have to use the quadratic formula. And if you use the quadratic formula and simplify, you would end up with negative 1 plus or minus i root 3 over 2 from the first one. And from the last one, you would end up with a positive 1 plus or minus i root 3 over 2. And because of the plus or minus, there's 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, and 6. There are six solutions which matches the sixth power. And it turns out that every polynomial has exactly the same number of solutions, if you count real and complex, as the degree of the problem. So with this in mind, we have a formula that we can use to calculate the roots of complex numbers. Let's let z equal the complex number r times the cosine of theta plus i sine of theta. And it turns out that the n roots are, or the nth root, the third root, the fourth root, the fifth root, are given by the formula the nth root of n times the cosine of theta plus 2k pi over n plus i times the sine of theta plus 2k pi over n. where k is equal to 0, 1, 2, and so on, all the way up to n minus 1. So we end at 1 less than the root that we are taking. This formula for the n roots is what we're going to be using on this next example. Let's say z squared equals 1 plus the square root of 3 times i. And we want to take the square roots of both sides to find out what z equals. Well, first we need to convert this into a polar form so we can use the formula. So with the polar form, our radius squared is equal to 1 squared plus the square root of 3 squared so our radius is 1 plus 3. The radius squared is 4, so I know the radius must be 2. The cosine of my angle is the x-coordinate divided by the radius, so the cosine is 1 half. The sine of my angle is the y-coordinate divided by my radius. It's root 3 over 2. And so if I draw my unit circle, x coordinate of 1 half, a y coordinate of root 3 over 2, it's going to be up here at pi over 3 equals theta. So now I can rewrite my problem as z squared equals a radius of 2 times, I'm going to go ahead and abbreviate it as cosine i sine pi over 3. The formula then tells us that z is going to be equal to the nth root. It's going to be the square root of the radius times the cosine. And we're going to actually, let's stick with the abbreviation for the sake of space. Cosine i sine of the angle pi over 3 plus 2 pi k all over the nth root, we're taking a second root, 2. And if we do a little bit of simplifying here, I'm going to multiply each term by 3. 
That will give us the square root of 2 times cosine plus i sine of the 3's divide out. So we get pi plus 6 pi k over 6. And that's going to work as k counts from 0 up to 1 less than the exponent, from 0 to 1. So if we start by letting k equal 0, we get the square root of 2 times, and I'm going to go ahead and expand it this time, cosine of, plugging 0 in for the k, makes 6 pi times 0 into 0. So we're just left with 1 pi over 6 plus i times the sine of 1 pi over 6. And if I think about my unit circle, 1 pi over 6 is root 3 over 2 comma 1 half. So we get the square root of 2 times cosine is root 3 over 2 plus i times the sine, which is 1 half. And multiplying out gives me the square root of 6 over 2 plus a square root of 2 over 2 times i. And that is our first square root of the original problem, 1 plus the square root of 3i. But there's a second root. Because we took a square root, second root, there should be two answers. If we took a fifth root, fifth root should have five answers. So now k equals 1. When I do that in my purple formula in the top right there, we end up with the square root of 2 times the cosine of 6 pi plus pi is going to be 7 pi over 6 plus i times the sine of now 7 pi over 6. And simplifying this will tell me my second root. 7 pi over 6 is over in the bottom left. It's got an x coordinate of negative root 3 over 2 and a y coordinate of negative 1 half. So we end up with the square root of 2 times. I'm going to scroll up to buy us some more space. Cosine is negative root 3 over 2 plus i times the sine, which is negative 1 half over 2. Distributing the square root through, we get negative square root of 6 over 2 Oop, minus. Distributing the square root 2 gives us square root of 2 over 2 i. And that becomes our second root. If you took either of these and you squared them, we'd get back to the original problem, which was 1 plus the square root of 3i. These problems really are a plug and chug practice using the formula. The formula might be a little clunky to get used to at first, but once you do, every problem becomes the same. So now it's your turn to practice some of these on your own, and let me know if you have any questions.